This is CBC Here and Now. I think it's pretty safe to say it's been the most expensive storm we've had. An eye-popping price tag for snow clearing in St. John's. And it just keeps coming. Temperatures are dropping as we head towards the weekend. Disappointing because um, we've had four years of continuous budget cuts already. Memorial University braces for more government cutbacks. We start tonight on the Avalon where a snowplow struck a pedestrian this afternoon. It happened near the university. Police got the call around lunchtime that somebody had been hit at the intersection of Elizabeth Avenue and Rodney Street. It's a popular spot for students crossing back and forth to the campus. Also, a very busy traffic spot. There's a crosswalk at that intersection. It also has flashing lights there. Police say the pedestrian was taken to hospital. No word on the extent of the injuries, but police believe they are not life-threatening. Another messy day today. We can thank an area of low pressure that's finally starting to move offshore. We should see things clear out as we head through the next couple of hours. But then we're going to watch this low pressure system and this cold front. That's going to bring some cold temperatures as we head through the next couple of days. It's going to bring some snow right along with it as well. You can see uh, that low will eventually track, bringing the, most of the snow along the west coast and then continuing as we head through the day on Thursday. So we do have a number of warnings in place, including some in extreme cold warnings. I'll have all those details coming up. Well, staying in Ashley's wheelhouse, the weather snowmageddon 2020 meant blowing snow and snow blowers and a blizzard that will likely blow the city's annual snow clearing budget by millions of dollars. St. John's budgeted more than $17 million for snow clearing this year, but now the mayor says it may cost millions more. Here now is Mark Quinn is live in downtown St. John's. Mark. Anthony, that's right. I'm right here on Water Street where just earlier this week we were hearing plans of maybe putting heated sidewalks here on Water Street. Now that plan has since been deemed too expensive. It's been nixed. And now, of course, after today's announcement, that sort of dream of having warm feet on this beautiful sidewalk and a clear, beautiful sidewalk seems even more remote. As sidewalk clearing crews fight yet another storm, St. John's mayor looked back with dread to the brutal blizzard that hit in mid-January. Compared to other years when we've had similar size storms, I think it's pretty safe to say it's been the most expensive storm we've had. Despite that, Breen says residents don't need to worry too much if the snow clearing budget is blown by five million more than expected. Overall, we don't expect that this is gonna have any impact on taxes. Breen also said the overrun won't mean service cuts either. He says the city has $2 million in reserve, surplus money from last year's budget, and he expects there will also be some relief money from the federal government. Still, it's only mid-February, and Breen says the city can't seem to catch up with what keeps falling down. And that's one of the things that we're, that we're finding here with these back-to-back -back events is that we're getting progress and we're getting there and, and then we have this kind of snow again, 15 centimeters, 20 centimeters, whatever it is that, that we end up getting and we've got to go back and, and start again. Now a possible $5 million cost overrun does seem like a lot of money, but Breen put it in context. He said the city's annual total budget is about $300 million. Live in St. John's, I'm Mark Quinn for Here and Now. Well, no matter the snowfall, it's natural to have that weary winter feeling with memories of the big ones still fresh in our minds. Our seas here headed out to see how people are coping with and surviving winter 2020. Now we'll try to get Cecil items for you a bit later on Here and Now. Uh, it's a lot of fun. It's been 12 years waiting for the moment. And that moment is here. This dad and daughter duo are teaming up for a major tournament. Meet a new Team Guju.
Well, as you heard earlier this week on Here and Now, low tuition fees are a major draw for Memorial University students. But once again, the budgetary knives are out. That's because more cuts are coming to MUN. As Here and Now's Terry Roberts reports, it's a situation that will renew the debate over tuition. Belt tightening has been going on here at MUN for years. We're talking millions in maintenance, for example, that has not been getting done. These asbestos patches here on the wall at the Arts and Administration Building, an example of that. Plenty of job cuts through attrition and layoffs. And now the provincial government has signaled it wants MUN to cut even deeper. It was disappointing because um, um, we've had four years of continuous budget cuts already. Word came down last week. Government wants to trim five and a half million from Munn's grant over the next two years. Munn has countered that government's calculations are wrong and the number should be closer to three million. But that's on top of 38 million in previous cuts. So now we're, we're down to actually cutting core, core people uh, and staff. And the big maintenance challenges are not being addressed. Evidence everywhere that Munn can't keep up. We're about 16 million under a year spending on deferred maintenance that we should be spending each and every year. We are spending about 7 million now. And another looming budget risk, new labor contracts that could put MUN further behind. If, if we end up where the other rest of the public sector uh, is, then our salary bill uh, you know, can go up $12 million a year. So that raises the obvious question. Is it time to jack up tuition rates? Rates that have been frozen by government for years and are among the lowest in the country. Kachinowski is about to leave his position here as president, and he's not shying away from that controversial topic before he goes. It's going to be on the table as a discussion, absolutely. I think it's going to be very difficult to do that without looking at the revenue side as well, which means tuition revenue generation is, is obviously where, where it would be. As for government, Advanced Education Minister Chris Mitchell-Moore is not talking. Terry Roberts, CBC News, St. John's. All right, well, we've reshuffled our story deck and get that story now from Cease Hare, who headed out to see how people are coping with and surviving winter 2020. Research does show that extreme weather, like the stuff we've had, does have an effect on a person's mood, emotions, behavior, and mental health. Oh, yeah. The difficulty backing out of a driveway on Blue River Place, barely wide enough for a fire truck, is a source of stress and anxiety. The shine has gone off those childhood memories of playing in mountains of snow. This winter in St. John's, it's a hard one. Every day you look out and, and there's always an inch or two that you have to go out and scrape and, and, and you're saying to yourself, my oh God, I gotta go out and do this again, you know? So there's, there's no end to it, you know? So it, uh, unlike a lot of people, I'd love to go down south. If you're feeling wary, experts say you're not alone. Those with existing mental health issues are especially vulnerable this time of year. Keeping productive helps, something Leo Martin knows all too well. And uh, this year recently, I, uh, I, I refinished the cupboards in my house. So that took me a month. So that's, we're, we're slowly getting to the end of the winter. How busy are you? Very, I'm a couple of weeks behind. It's almost impossible to keep ahead of the mess. So these conditions are just horrible. Horrible on snowblowers too. It's Young's job to fix busted blowers at Kingsbridge service station. So many, he has to move them out each day to make enough room to work in. Customers, he says, are tired of this weather, and he agrees. I'm kind of, I'm more of a springtime, summertime type of guy. I really, uh, yeah, I, I'm getting there now. <laughs> getting would, tired of it. I wouldn't mind seeing a bit of pavement and, a, you know. Some sun. Some sunshine for sure, 100%. The experts say if snowbanks like these are starting to get you down, keep yourself busy, plan something fun, and as always, look after yourself. Cease here, CBC News, Southlands. Well, moving to other news now, a 33-year-old man was killed in a car crash in Conception Bay South last night. This happened shortly before 10 o'clock on Peacekeeper's Way. That's the stretch between the Trans-Canada Highway and Fowler's Road. The man was traveling alone and he was pronounced dead at the scene of the accident. Police still investigating the cause of that crash. Well, to some sad news now out of Nova Scotia. A boy with terminal brain cancer who captured the hearts of many people in our province has died. You might remember Leland Hill Beck, the nine-year-old charmed the province last summer with his wish to meet his great-grandmother for the very first time. 
The Children's Wish Foundation brought him to St. John's so that he could throw her a 90th birthday party. And at the time, his dad Shane told Here and Now that living in the moment and trying to give his son the best summer possible was what kept him going. Shortly after returning home to Halifax, Leland was admitted to hospital and the family has spent the last seven months there. Leland's funeral is set for Saturday. Well, let's return to a story that we brought you last night that has and will no doubt continue to generate plenty of reaction. It has to do with the question of amalgamation or regionalization, depending which word you prefer, and how far communities on the Northeast Avalon need to go so that they can simply work together in better ways. Now, Carolyn spoke with Dennis O'Keefe. The former St. John's mayor is a longtime supporter of getting rid of the boundaries that separate municipalities on the Northeast Avalon. O'Keefe used his own grandkids as an example. They live in the St. John's neighborhood of Southlands, but go to school in Mount Pearl and they do all their after school activities in Mount Pearl as well. So today we asked current St. John's Mayor Danny Breen for his thoughts. Oh, we, we have great regional partners and uh, we do a lot of good work together on water, wastewater, uh, fire um, and, uh, and uh, landfill. I think there's greater opportunities for regionalization, uh, whether you call it amalgamation or whatever you call it, I think we can cooperate better regionally. I think areas such as recreation uh, is another area where we can uh, where we can cooperate better. Economic development is an area where uh, where we can uh, make uh, make better use of the resources we have and make you know on the world stage and on, on the national stage, we're competing with Halifax and Aberdeen. We're not competing with other municipalities. And I think that if we work together locally, what's good for St. John's is good for Mount Pearl, and what's good for Mount Pearl is good for St. John's, and what's good for Cornerbrook is good for St. John's and Newfoundland and Labrador. I think we can all work together. Well, now to some uh, educational innovation. Students in St. John's can now get hands-on experience mastering digital technologies such as 3D printing. The nonprofit group Brilliant Labs has opened the Avalon Makerspace where teachers and students can learn some new skills. Here now, Stephen Miller was there for today's grand opening. The weather kept many schools closed today, but it didn't stop the English school district and politicians from getting a close-up look at how the Avalon Makerspace will work. Okay, Alyssa cool. Sampson is an after-school mentor here. Her job is to help teach students how to use cutting-edge technology like 3D printers, electronics prototyping materials, and laser cutters. I'm here with Alyssa at the brand new Makerspace by Brilliant Labs. She's going to give me a tour and show me some of the cool technology that students will be learning when they come here. We are looking at micro bits. These little panels right here are built into the robot and they sense the white and turn every time they do. So this little guy is going around the figure eight. Use different kind of codes to set it up so that if you press ground right here, the guitar will make different sounds and change colors. Okay, and you program this yourself? Yeah. And how familiar were you with this program? Not at all. <laughs> the piece of equipment many people here find the most exciting is the 3D printer on account of its near limitless applications. So what, what is it making right now? Right now it is making, a, actually it's making this, the finished product, which we put our micro bits in and we can also match them to the wall like we have over there. Okay, so like right now, what's controlling the light strip is... Some little micro bit that I was just showing you, yes. Every time you challenge a student to be hands-on and engage and solve problems that they care about or passionate about, the level of depth and knowledge that they are able to kind of figure out for themselves is awesome. Right now, Brilliant Labs is working with about 85% of the province's schools to get kids and teachers in spaces like these. But it hopes in coming months to start opening its doors to anyone who wants to show up and learn. Stephen Miller, CBC News, St. John's. Well, now to some sports news. Brad Guju took to the ice in St. John's today with a new partner by his side. The former Olympic champ has gone outside the province to find talent before, but he didn't have to look far to find his newest teammate. Here now's Ryan Cook explains. It's a new chapter in an already illustrious career. This one is different, but it's just as important. Brad Guju has entered the mixed doubles game with his daughter Haley. It's a lot of fun. It's been 12 years waiting for the moment. Uh, you know, she played great today and it's just a lot of fun out here. We have no expectations other than coming out here having fun and, uh, you know, giving her some experience. The Gujus opened the Provincial Mixed Doubles Championship facing off against the defending champs from Port Basque. They lost by one in the last end. We were two up coming home and, uh, 
I missed all three of my shots. She made hers, <laughs> but uh, I got to take the onus on that one. Uh, but we play, we play good. Uh, obviously, a tight game with the defending pr provincial champs. It's uh, you know proud of her performance and proud of how she played today. Curling fans have watched Brad Guju grow up on their screens. In 2006, the first thing he did after winning Olympic gold was call his mother. In 2017, after winning the Briar, he immediately went to his daughters. He's become the proud parent, and now he's becoming a teammate. Is his uh, curling style different than his parenting style? Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> what's, what's he like to curl with? Um... You gotta be careful now how you answer this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> For Haley, curling is more of a casual sport. She's more involved with volleyball right now, but her delivery is natural. The skills are there, and her father couldn't be happier. I love the fact that she's interested in the game, and, and uh, I'd love to see her play it because it's a it's a game that uh, you know has meant a lot to me and, and brought me a lot as far as traveling the world and, and meeting a lot of amazing people. So. Uh, yeah, hopefully she has a similar experience, whether it's in curling or volleyball or some of the other sports that she plays as well. Team Goju says it has no expectations for the tournament, but with a winning pedigree that runs in the family, that could change as the week goes on. Ryan Cook, CBC News, St. John's. In just a few months, plastic grocery bags will be history in this province. An expert in plastic pollution says it's an important step, but it's just the first step. And if we don't have a plan for the next steps, the bag ban could be a bust. Max Liberon is an associate professor at Memorial University. Here's her take on this hot topic. So it's really exciting that Newfoundland and Labrador is going to be the second province to ban blast plastic bags on July 1st. It's outstanding, real political will and capacity there. But the question for me, because I focus on marine plastics, is what's going to happen in that specific region once the bag ban comes in. I have a huge data set that stretches all the way back to 2014, gathered by citizen scientists that show that about 80 to 85% of the waste that ends up on shorelines here is plastic. Of that, only 2% is plastic bags. What's really interesting about that data is that we have some from Nain in Labrador, where that community put in a plastic bag ban in 2009, one of the first in the world, right, really cutting edge. And so what I find is that some of the highest percentages of plastic bags are in Labrador, including Nain, which is 11% of their waste are plastic bags, compared to the 2% of the rest of the province. And of that 11%, none of it are carrier bags, like from Sobeys. They're all the bags that are in our exemption. Garbage bags, Ziploc bags, bags from fish and packaging food. So plastic bag ban is one step of a multi-step process. The second step is, okay, what do you do now? Right now, there's been a coordinated response to ban the bag, but there isn't an equal coordinated response to find an alternative that is not other types of disposables, specifically plastic disposables. And so that's where a lot of work remains. Before July 1st, people have to start coordinating businesses, government, NGOs, community groups. What are we gonna provide that's different? What's going to be made available? Because that's what's getting used. So this is why I'm really looking for people to find, especially for the people of Newfoundland and Labrador who are very good at making do, who have very long memories for generations. What are the types of things that we use before disposables, before plastics of any kind to package our items? And how and when can we return to those? So if step one is banning bags, step two is finding good alternatives. Step three is then moving that political will and that precedent into working on the plastics that are more meaningful for this province. And in this province, that's fishing gear and cigarette butts. In my studies, when I look in the guts of animals for plastics, I'm probably not going to notice the effect of the bag ban. I will notice if we move on cigarette butts and on fishing gear. I'm hoping that in Newfoundland and Labrador, because we're an ocean province, because uh, a lot of our culture, our identity, our lives and our livelihoods happen on the ocean, we'll have the political will and capacity to move to fishing gear and move to cigarette butts, which will not be banned. You cannot ban those things. And so there's going to be much more intricate work moving on from plastic bags for that. And I think we have the guts to do it.
because if we don't act now, we're probably going to lose the building. It provides like a beautiful artistic experience for the town. So I guess we're getting a church. This weather update is brought to you by the NL511 app. No, before you go. Check road conditions, highway cameras, and the provincial plow tracker with the NL511 app. Well, this afternoon it seems like everybody is out trying to attack their driveways sort of sort of mid-afternoon, getting towards the end of the workday. But before we get to the weather, last night we mentioned the Kayak W and the issues that it's had cutting through the Strait of Belle Isle. Well, Labrador Marine sent us along some shots which really paint a picture. Check this out. Yeah, no wonder it can't make it or make the run. In one photo, you can actually see the indent left by the Henry Larson. That's about as far as the icebreaker got before having to turn around. Yeah, so as you can see, the ice there, very, very thick. Lots to contend with. And uh, so that's the Larson that's the indent, you see there yeah. and the indent that Ashley was mentioning. So there's the kayak completely surrounded. Uh, it's incredible, actually, take a look at that. You could actually walk along that, no problem. Appreciate you sending those pictures along, but it gives you a sense of uh, the ice that they're contending and with. And how fast it happened. Yeah. I mean, we were just talking about last week, how, was it February? I can't remember the date, February 4th or something. They mm -hmm. started ice breaking, and what are we now? And here we are, yep. So uh, I mentioned I was going around and seeing everybody with snowblower shovels, the usual kind of thing. Everybody really, really trying to attack that. And we heard early in the program, of course, it's going to be pretty expensive for the city of St. John's. 
And you put together a little bit of snow info about where we are right now? Yeah, because uh, based on what was it, 350 centimeters is what the St. John's uh, the mayor, the mayor yeah. uh, base is theirs on. So, so far this season, and this is, again, there go January to December, but so far this season, we've had 316 centimeters Whoa. of snow. Year to date, starting uh, in January, 225. That's including what fell today, 225 centimeters has fallen. So right. uh, we're pretty close. To, <laughs> we're so not Dan, that far away. Yeah, Mayor Danny Breen is watching this right now, reaching for the heart pills, right? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah compared to last year, only uh, 273 centimeters fell from January to December. So it's uh, it's a lot of snow. Obviously, that one day snowfall uh, really helped that situation. But uh, <laughs> as far as what we're seeing today, it was a mild day, even though we saw all of that snow. We're about 15 centimeters at the airport right now. Gander uh, reporting, I believe it was 11 or 12 centimeters at this point. Uh, but temperatures are in those minus single digits. Mild up through Labrador as well. Happy Valley Goose Bay sitting at minus 6. Lab City sitting at minus 8. And then we do have a little bit of a wind chill. It's pretty gusty out there. Feeling closer to the minus uh, double digits across most areas, minus 13 up through Happy Valley Goose Bay. And these temperatures are just going to drop as we head through the next uh, next couple of days. So that area of low pressure is going to move off. We should see things uh, improve as we head through the night tonight. As far as uh, cloud cover goes, that snow should end. And we're actually looking at pretty fair skies as we head through the overnight tonight. You can see uh, most of that snow has moved offshore. We do still have uh, some flurries along the west coast. But again, that will end tonight. Those uh, warnings still very much in place, but I do anticipate that they will end within the next probably hour or so. Uh, but we could still see some blowing snow, certainly uh, for parts of central as uh, those winds are going to stay a little breezy tonight. Now these uh, these warnings even up through Labrador, we've got an extreme cold warning and a winter storm warning for Gross Morn and uh, a little bit further north of that. And that's because the next system's going to bring uh, some snow with it and it's a cold front. And that's also what's bringing some of those cooler temperatures. So overnight tonight, we are gonna start to see some snow push through parts of Western uh, Labrador and then continue to track a little bit further east overnight tonight. And those temperatures are going to drop. So we're looking at uh, minus 26 for Lab City. So you're dropping quite a few degrees tonight, minus 17 for Happy Valley Goose Bay. Otherwise, we're going to sit in those minus single digits. Now, I mentioned those winds staying strong again uh, tomorrow. So anywhere from 50 to as much as 70 kilometers per hour, generally out of the south southwest. And then they're going to stay strong through the day, picking back up again. So 40 to 60 kilometer per hour winds expected for the majority of the island. So uh, once we see that cold front start to sweep through. It's going to bring some snow right along with it. The most snow will be along uh, along the Long Range Mountains. You're looking at anywhere from 15 to as much as 20 centimeters. Otherwise, along the coast, 5 to 10. It's a good bet for the southern portion of the Avalon as well as the Buren Peninsula. Otherwise, we're looking at about 2 to 5 centimeters through the day tomorrow. Nothing that we can't handle, but those winds, again, staying breezy through the day. Uh, you can see some of that colder air starting to push through. It's certainly going to do so. Uh, this air is going to sink further south, but before that, some sunshine for Lab City, minus 24. As that cold front pushes through, it's going to bring those cooler temperatures, but you're still looking at a lovely afternoon for the southwestern portion of uh, the Big Land. Minus 3 will be your afternoon high for Mary's Harbor. So that's a look at your forecast for tomorrow. We'll talk about how cold it's going to get when I come back. Take two got taken to the cleaners when somebody robbed $3,000. But a local company is here to help out.
Well, back to a story about Take Two, the shop that sells gently used clothing and some other goods. Somebody robbed the store of $3,000, and that was quite the shock to staff and customers. Empower, the group that set up Take Two, hires people who have disabilities. And a local company, Newfound Cab, stepped up and gave Take Two $3,000 to make up for that theft. So I dropped by to talk with the friendly staff on Ropewalk Lane about what this good news means to them. Okay, so, uh, Margaret, what's happened here lately? Well, I happened to have the, all the past couple of weeks and that uh, we have getting a lot of, in the news and that we had getting a lot of donations came by and uh, money and, and clothes and everything uh, to help us to keep the store open and keep Empower running. And also, uh, you have to say, found out yesterday from Newfoundland Cabs, they had donated uh, over the money that we had last over three times. $3,000. To a place like Take Two, how it's, important is it? It's very important because it's, uh, it's helping people to get back and forth to work, helping our volunteers go back to work, you know, get in go bus, mm -hmm. you know, helping them come here to get socialized with people, you know, to get away from their anxiety, from being at home. So what are your thoughts about um, what makes this place? We've, we've been here, we've actually done our, here and now, we've done a show from here. How important is a store like this? Uh, is very important because it helps people with uh, disability to because uh, these co-workers really helps help a lot of, lot of these people big time yeah what did you how did you react when you found out there had been a robbery here I was surprised and shocked and uh, for a small thrift store I don't think it should have happened when I found out because I was supposed to come over and volunteer that day and I couldn't come like I usually do and I find since I started this coming here that it has helped me with my anxiety, helped me with everything, like, you know, between clothes, between, like, everything that I never needed, I always got here. And I used to spend, like, every day here anyway, even if I didn't volunteer. And when I found out that, I was, I was so upset that they could go do that to people that are such good people that are there to help everybody. And when I found out that, I was like, I can't believe they got the gall to do it. Cause these people are like great people and they work hard to keep this store here and like keep it clean and everybody chips in and yeah. and that's why I come here every day. Now you mentioned your anxiety, so do you deal with anxiety? Um, it took me a couple of years to come here only for the people here and like in power I wouldn't be here today like doing the volunteering and wanting to be here every day and they helped me come here and I've been here since October and I hate even to take a day off because I love it here. You got a big smile on your face. <laughs> <laughs> Is she always like this? Yeah. Oh, all the time, yeah. Really? Yep. Yeah, she's fun to be around. Yeah, and then you say it's because you actually get to come to a place like this. Yes, and there's somewhere for people that, you know, can't get jobs and can't afford to do anything else. And, like, I come here and I think it's awesome. Yeah. I think, like, these people deserve more than what they know. <laughs> I guess, you know, it's important to point out that even a thrift shop has sort of a downtime in sales after Christmas, and here we are January, mm -hmm. February, there's the blizzard. It's not just the robbery, but it's also slow time yes, for sales. Yeah, it's very slow time. Every year is always slow time, yeah. What do you like about working here? Um, I like that there's no judgment due to your disability, or whether it be physical or mental, because everyone here has a disability, whether it's physical or mental. Yeah. So, if, and if I'm having a bad day, and I just want to go on back, not deal with the public. Mm -hmm. I, someone will, can easily um, cover me. Right. right. So it's almost as though you guys have different issues, different disabilities, but you can sort of like, it's not just a store, it's like a support group. Yeah. Yes, yeah. basically it's, it's mm -hmm. like, for me, like, I know it's April for a long time now, and she got anxiety, and if she comes to me, she's having a bad day, I'll sit down and talk to her in the mornings. I'll sit up, or, or Diane, if she's having a bad day, I'll sit, or Nick, or Nick, or anyone. Or if I'm having a bad day myself, I say, guys, I can't, I can't. All of us do. Yep. I can't be out in the back, or I can't be out in the front. I need to be out in the back. Right. And, you know, they will all cover. We each cover each other. Well, listen, obviously you all get a lot out of being part of this organization, and it's great news that you're going to get back on your feet. And uh, eventually the snow will melt, and maybe mm -hmm. sales will get back mm -hmm. to normal. And, uh, I, and it will. Yeah. <laughs> it will, for sure. I know that. All right. Well, listen, thank you all very much for sharing your thoughts with me. appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you so you're much. Welcome. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you.
beginning a new series tonight called Repurposed. For the next several Wednesdays, we'll bring you stories of how former churches are finding a new purpose. Tonight, video producer Mark Humby takes us to a concert venue in Heart's Content. The church was built in 1878, so it's 141 years old. It was the former uh, Hayfield United Church, and Jesse Hayfield was here from England, and he did two stints here. And he came back, I think, in 1910, and he passed away, and he's actually buried out in the graveyard. In uh, 2007, it was listed on the uh, Register of Canada's Historic Places. But then in 2009, it was vacant, it was not used, it was starting to fall into a state of disrepair, and it was slated for demolition. The Harris Content Music Heritage Society, which, which is the group that I'm involved with, uh, bought the building for a dollar, and uh, with the intention of uh, repurposing it into a performing arts center. Up and down the shore, uh, the Trinity South region here, we have uh, no venue quite like this one. We have, you know, this is primarily a concert venue, a uh, beautiful sound system. We've had several concerts now over the last couple of years, and uh, it's a performance venue that uh, artists really enjoy playing in. To me, it really works because we're close enough to the audience that we're, they, we feel we're engaging them and they're close enough to us that they feel that they're being engaged. For lack of a better word, it's been a real godsend that a lot of these, these old churches are turning into venues, uh, mainly because the circuit is alive again. Before uh, the Cod Moratorium, uh, you talked to a lot of the older musicians, uh, they, there used to be a circuit and all these New Flanders musicians could like just travel around the island, play, spend one week or weekend in, another, in a place, and play there and go to the next place, and, and people were quite happy, content, and made real good money cleaning that circuit. Uh, when the moratorium happened in 92, that all came crashing down because all these small communities started disappearing. So uh, well, I was very appreciative of these uh, little church houses turned into music venues. Survey said. A big win for a Newfoundland family, but will they do it again tonight?
Welcome back to Here and Now. A family from central Newfoundland is celebrating a big win. The Mercer sisters appeared on the game show Family Feud last night and they walked away with the top prize of $10,000. But it's not over yet. We caught up with two of the sisters this afternoon in Stoneville. Time for Family Feud Canada! From Horwood, Newfoundland and Labrador, it's the Mercer family! We were accepted for Family Feud Canada. What? And so excited we were. Yeah. It was a once in a lifetime thing, like even to go on the show, you know, and, and to see how it's done. Yeah, we were really excited by going and, you know, it was wonderful. You know, great wonderful. It was Perfect. absolutely <laughs> awesome. The Mercer family has won the game and they are ready to win. So we decided that me and her would do the fast money. But anyway, I went out first, as you can tell. And she came out and saw that I only had 65 points. What was you going to do? I was going to do this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Name a seasoning a chef uses the most. Uh, ranch. The ranch dressing. <laughs> oh, my dear. I almost got killed for that. <laughs> <laughs> went back to our hotel room and our sister wavy. She came in and she said, wave, we call her wave. She came in and she said, boy, they're dying. The next time I fry the steak, I'll have ranch on that one. As soon as I said ranch, I said, oh, no, because she had to get 135 points. I thought, well, when I seen that I had to get 135 points, I said, I'm not going to do this. Because usually they're up our points. But I pulled it off. Before I left Ontario, I said, how am I going to keep this a secret now? Yes. And but after I got home and I was saying no, we well, can't tell you, I can't tell you. Not even my husband knew thing. I had people at my house, my friends and family, my children, and Gertie went to her, her my son, son just out across the garden, child. With 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 ten or twelve grandchildren, you know, they were so excited. Oh, you should see them when we won them. <laughs> yes, my at my house too. My friend just danced around. <laughs> My grandkids, like they're from 12 up to 17. Oh, they were. So they jumped up just the same they were in the audience. Survey said. Come on. <laughs> we're the champs, you know. We're the champs. <laughs> well, our show comes on again tonight. And you got to watch and see. Yeah. <laughs> Best of luck to the Mercer sisters tonight. I'm sure lots of people will be watching as they go for round two on Family Feud. And if you want to watch, the show airs at 8 o'clock Newfoundland time, 8.30 in parts of Labrador on CBC Television and on the CBC Gem app. Okay, to a different kind of game. It's a sport that has nothing to do with its name. Pickleball is, yes, pickleball, one of the fastest growing sports in North America, including here in St. John's. It combines ping pong, tennis, and badminton, and it's become so popular, a local tennis club is opening its doors to players. Greenbelt started offering trial sessions last month. Here now is Jeremy Eaton. Stop by. It's been going on for quite a while here and there. So yeah, we came down here, helped them uh, set up the courts, and for lessons, the best way to, to get, get people started is to start with a beginner lesson, because at the field house, there's no lesson as such, right? We just play and then hope to gain something from other people. But here, you offer formal lessons, it's always the best way to learn, just like anything else. There's uh, a lot of demand for pickleball. Uh, we have excess capacity. We have times during the middle of the day when uh, our courts are, are underutilized. And um, so what we find is that a lot of the pickleball players are in a demographic where they are available that time of day. So it um, allows us to meet that capacity and also to develop some extra revenue streams for the club. If the ball is high, don't try to run backwards like that to hit it. We can fit a, a number of uh, regulation pickleball courts inside of the tennis courts. So for example, right here, we have two pickleball courts just on one half of a tennis court. And as the program grows, we'll expand this across, across other courts. The response has been phenomenal. Um, this is a week ago, we put out an email blast and a Facebook post saying that we were going to offer three learn to play sessions. And in less than 
18 hours, we had all three sessions filled and a waiting list. So because of that, we're now going to offer four more sessions next week. A lot of people were telling me this is a fun game, and I, I like playing tennis. I'm in a member of the club here, and I figure, you know, anything is a, a challenge and anything for fun, put it that way, especially when you're retired at my age. What do you think of pickleball? I like it. I like it a lot, right? Uh, yeah, first of all, it's very welcoming here. It seems to be an interesting game, and it's a way to get a little bit of exercise, get you up off the couch, and why not? Are tennis players and pickleball players, are they able to coexist on the courts? Or have they been able to so far? Well, it's, it's all been very good so far. I mean, particularly our long-term tennis players, uh, you know, they recognize that uh, creating additional revenue streams are, are important to the, to, to the club's well-being long-term. And um, so it's, it's been a bit of a change. Uh, right now, we've only got two pickleball courts. We've, you know, sort of taken a a thin edge of the wedge approach to this but I think as the popularity grows and as more people know we're here and um, it, it will become uh, just part of, of the Greenbelt community. The weather update is brought to you by Belltone, your partner in better hearing. Okay, I'm looking forward to snow removal after tonight's program. Really? No, I'm not okay. actually. Being <laughs> I was a say you're lying. I'm trying to think positive. Yeah. You have to think positive. Yep, the alternative is not so pleasant. No. So where do you want to start? Temperatures dropping. Okay. Let's do that. All right. Uh, yeah, we're going to see some cold air push through Labrador and then continue to sink a little bit further south. Let's take a look at the timeline for that. So this is uh, tomorrow night. So you can see that cold air, those pink temp or those pinks are uh, temperatures in the minus 20s. That's going to spread across uh, the big land as we head through the day on Friday. 
and then eventually sink further south, uh, affecting portions of the island as well. Certainly through the day on Friday and then even uh, into the day on Saturday, we're still looking at those cooler temperatures. Eventually they'll retreat, they'll move a little bit further north and we'll see uh, some more seasonal temperatures move in across the island, but it's still going to stay pretty chilly up through Labrador. So Environment Canada already has some extreme cold warnings in effect for Lab West as well as the Northern Peninsula. Lab West, you're looking at wind chills in the minus 40 range and for the Northern Peninsula, that's closer to the minus 30, minus 35 range. And this again will be for tomorrow night into Friday. So here's your temperatures. There's what I'm talking about. So temperatures in the minus 20s is a daytime high for Lab West, minus teens across the board. So these wind chills as well. You're going to expect wind chills in the minus 20s uh, into the afternoon, even minus 25 potentially. But uh, again, unsettled central Newfoundland, you're looking at the most potential for some sunshine. Otherwise, it looks like flurries across the board. Nain, uh, chilly and sunshine as well. So minus 18 will be your afternoon high on Friday. So taking a look at uh, what we're going to see as we head through the weekend. Uh, ridge of high pressure will skirt south of us. We're still looking at that onshore flow uh, into Saturday. So areas along the west coast, you're still looking at the potential for some onshore flurries. Cloud cover will move in on Sunday, it looks like, and the next system will move in. That's going to bring some cloud cover and the potential for some snow as well as we head into Monday. So it is going to be unsettled for the next little bit. And then uh, by Monday evening, the trough that will move through is uh, going to bring in some of that warmer air to the south. So areas of eastern Newfoundland at this point look like you'll probably change over to rain through the day. Nothing significant uh, at this point. And then in another area of high pressure, high pressure will move through. So here's where you're looking temperature wise. It's a roller coaster minus 11 by Friday, as I mentioned back and then slowly climbing as we head into Monday. But it does look generally gray for both Sunday and Monday with your temperature hovering around the zero degree mark. Now for central Newfoundland sunshine, both Friday and Saturday and then Sunday we get into that unsettled weather. Again, your temperatures will be climbing. It's essentially the same forecast for western Newfoundland, but you're looking at uh, the onshore flurries continuing. So gray skies for the most part minus one by Monday. Monday and then up through Labrador uh, flurries by Friday, Saturday and Sunday look nice and your temperatures will climb as well. Finally getting uh, out of those well below seasonal temperatures. And then for Western Labrador, minus 23 by Friday, your overnight lows dipping just for a few days into those minus 30 range. It'll get right back into that as we head into Monday. Well, I showed you some cat pictures, so I had to show you a dog picture. Balance. <laughs> it's all about balance. I'll tell you where this is too when we come back.
Okay, so we promised us, well, we actually asked you for certain pictures uh, of cats, but the picture that Ashley showed you before the break, beautiful dog. Because I can't, I have to show you a dog. Yeah. Of course. Let's, let's take a look at the weather photo of the day, or your viewer photo of the day, I should say. That's Red, enjoying a bird's eye view Up on top of a snowbank, yeah, which the, is... With the birdhouse right behind him, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. He does have a kind of what are you looking at kind of face there. He's a cutie. Yeah. yeah. Now, Frank Walter sent us that shot. Thank you so much for sending that in. And if you have any photos to share with us, send them to nlphotos at cbc.ca. Right. Now, we also mentioned that uh, we do show a lot of photos of dogs, as you can see with red there. <laughs> and so we actually invited you, our viewers, or I did anyway, mm -hmm. uh, to send us some cat photos in the interest of feline canine balance. And uh, take a look, you certainly answered in droves. And so quickly, <laughs> look at this one, Ginger the cat. <laughs> yep, after the snow shoveling, Ginger takes a break. Yep. It looks pretty happy. Yeah. And that is not Ginger, that's the back of uh, Riley. That's right? right. Rob Thomas sent us that picture, enjoying a bit of snow, not, not dandruff, it's just a bit of snow. And yeah, <laughs> Becca Wall sent us this photo of Gremlin so over snowmageddon yeah. at that point. Yeah, Gremlin looks like, what the, out of here. And this is <laughs> Freddy. Chris Parsons sent it. So you see all these cats are out in the snow, right? So it's not just dogs that are out there. No. All right? Yeah. Got to stand up for my peeps. And <laughs> <laughs> this is Bello. Ruby uh, Hooper sent us this photo. Mm -hmm. Bello just enjoying the outdoors the proper way, looking from inside. That's so my favorite go. photo, though. I, I got to say. Shovel? Me? Never. I don't have a cat. Yeah. And uh, so they, uh, you know. You poor empty person. <laughs> Anyhow, dogs, cats, if you have pictures of your pets out in the snow, we've had a lot of pictures of sunsets and places in Newfoundland, but if you want to share some of your pet photos enjoying winter 2020. Or your kids. Yeah. Or yourself. There's so much to enjoy. There you go. It's all open. <laughs> so pets, kids, whatever you like, send them on in. I hope you're okay if you're out there shoveling tonight. Mm -hmm. Do take it easy. Don't overdo it. Make sure you're well, you're, you know, people can see you. Wear a vest if you can if you're shoveling at night. Yep. And uh, we'll see you tomorrow. All right, good night.